Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and this is Cutting Through the Matrix on the 31st of August 2012. For newcomers, I always suggest you make good use of the website CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com and there's uh, an awful lot of audios there for free download and uh, you'll start to understand the big system you're born into because you really are born into a maze or a matrix uh, where when you start to understand things are wrong, you go off in your search and your journey and then there's all these distractions intentionally put there too because those who rule, of course, understand uh, psychology perfectly well and they know the routine that most folk will go through trying to find what's really going on and uh, and even coming to the stages where they, they come into shock where they find out that everything they believed in was actually propaganda and indoctrinated lying which they were taught in school or from even their parents who didn't know either. So we're all running and existing for big business, big corporations, international corporations, and they have given us the culture, they have given us the system, and they plan the future as well. So help yourself to the audios, find the big organizations behind it, how far back it goes, and it goes back an awful long ways with the organizations and foundations that decided to be the parallel government, the real government, in fact, the one that you don't elect in, that makes all the moves and runs thousands of non-governmental organizations. Member two, you're the audience to bring me to you. You can keep me going by buying the books and discs at cuttingthroughthematrix.com. And from the U.S. to Canada, remember you can use personal checks or international postal money orders. You can use PayPal or send cash. And across the world, you've got Western Union, MoneyGram, and PayPal once again. Straight donations are awfully, awfully welcome in these uh, becoming even more austere times as we go into quantitative easing, which is just hyperinflation in, in a slow level, basically. And as I say, what I do is tie the past to the present to show you mm, that you shouldn't just get caught up in today's news because today's news is put up by the bucket load for you to prattle about. And I've gone through the, the writings of Jack C. Lull, for instance, who talks about the, uh, the information system and how you are overdosed with useless data. You, you won't retain anyway, very little of it you'll retain. And a lot of it's there to distract you and simply run you in circles again until you switch back off and go back into the crowd. The crowd of the general population who are quite content to go along being ruled by people they don't even know, will never meet and they're quite happy with that. They're socialized and domesticated. So that's really what Alal talked about, the overload of, of data and how you cannot get truth by just stuffing your head full of, of the data that's put out there for you to do. You must have an idea of what you're looking for, and you must have an idea of where to look for it as well. And stick to your and stick to your sites basically. Don't go off track and, and continue and that's how you get to the truth. Because we live in a circus a media circus owned by, again, the big boys who own the foundations and who run the parallel government, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Royal Institute for International Affairs. They have branches all across the planet in every single country, even in China. Now, the trick, as I say, is to keep you immersed in today's happenings and giving you emotional things to, to really bitch about. What happens too, the more you bitch, the more angry you get. And at the same time, there's no relief valve for the anger because technically you start to realize that you're, you don't have a say in anything. Everything happens away above you, a higher level, and that there's no group out there already established to speak for you. And therefore, you become frustrated. Many folk give up, get depressed, and even turn on others who are still seeking. That can happen too. And you can't blame them, you know. And I'll be back with more after this break. Hi folks, I'm back cutting through the matrix talking about the big system we're born into. And it truly is a big system, and nothing's been overlooked regarding the management of vast herds of the population. And it's a very old art, of course, is, is managing the minds of the general public. Uh, we have lots of entertainment for the, for the, it's called popular culture. 
and they have the higher culture for themselves, of course, but they give us popular culture. Aldous Huxley talked about that too, and, and in quite good detail and in quite accurate detail as well. But you've got to understand that whatever culture is given to the public is for a, there's a, a, not just an advertising or a sales pitch behind it all to profit the big corporations. It's also to manage the populations on behalf of the corporations. They train us to be what they want. And I've gone through in the past, I've gone through with Bernays, and Bernays himself is, is um, chalked up to be the, the guy who really started it off in a real, a real coherent fashion as far as um, propaganda and how to manipulate the masses, uh, even to make them purchase and buy. And he was given the credit for creating the, the consumer society for America for a long time. But really, he learned it from even older people than him because it's a very old art. And there are certain people down through the ages, especially mark merchants, of course. They've always been in the business of getting goods and seeing how they can, they can unload them on people and make them appealing, even causing fashions or designs or something to get the, the public going. Today is get a, a celebrity to do something that's um, as, as way out there and everyone follows suit. It's very easy to do with mass communication, television and so on. But... Getting back to last night's talk about Jack Satali. Now, remember Jack Satali uh, is, uh, is a high hoot spot up there. Of course, he was bred for his purpose, I think. And I really mean that. A lot of them are bred for their purpose, and they're placed into very, very uh, high positions in early age. And he goes through the system and the future in his various books. And you must remember, too, when you read them, he's also a geopolitician. So anything that's published for the general public will have a lot of scary stuff in it, too, uh, as, as they go through their scenarios to the future and their wonderful utopia at the end of it all. But so, so we might keep that in mind. And keep in mind, too, that being a geopolitician, he has particular favorites and favorite countries as well to look after. Uh, and wants to demonize, too. But he goes through the future, which was already here. And remember, too, the, that Atali is well aware of the Royal Institute of International Affairs that came out with the whole global world agenda where corporations and the intelligentsia would rule the world uh, totally in, into a planned society. Even He's well aware of all this stuff because he's part of it. But he doesn't mention this in his book, of course. But this, this book here is um, it's, it's a brief... Uh, history of the future, and he says that these technologies, we're driven by technologies now, you see, will make themselves felt at a time when the costs of public services become heavier and heavier. Country by country, sector by sector, they'll progressively reduce the role of the state and the public institutions for provisions of the future. Thus, after rising, the share of collective expenses in the national revenue of each country will fall disastrously. Growth of markets in the polycentric world will then work in the same direction as these technologies and will themselves contribute to the massive weakening of states, states or nations, remember. First of all, the great uh, corporations with a basic, um, a basis of thousands of specialist companies will bring influence to bear on the media using advertising to blackmail them in order to orient citizens' choices. Well, that's already been happening in your whole lives whether you know it or not, uh, all media runs on advertising. And lots of it is free advertising. I mean, free sheets, that is. Uh, a lot of the people, and it's put out in your, in your mailboxes and things like that. Three quarters advertising goes to, to make a big profit for the people who put the stuff out. The rest of the trivia or stories is put in it. It's just there as a filler, basically. But uh, it works awfully well. And the same with the ones you buy. So you're buying advertising. This is in an early phase when wealthy uh, minorities realize that they have more to gain by putting property on the market than by putting it to the vote. They'll do everything to have that property privatized. Thus, for example, when a rich minority thinks that their retirement system is alloc- by allocation is no longer in, the, in line with its interests, it'll shift it by initiating short-lived alliances into a system of retirement by capitalization so that its pensions will no longer depend on a majority decision that might prove unfavorable to it. The same will be true for health, police, education, and the environment. Well, in other words, big corporations are going to run everything, you see, including the insurance companies, big time. And they will have you monitored 24 hours a day, like I mentioned last night from the same book. 
and they'll get in touch with you if they think you're not exercising enough or you're eating too much of the wrong stuff or, or too much, period. And they will penalize you and up your premiums. That's the way the future. That's how you train the public. It's like Pavlov, you see. It's quite simple. It says, then the market by uh, nature uh, planetary will violate or breach the laws of democracy by local nature, local. Uh, the wealthiest members of the innovative class, a few hundred million amongst the two billion holders of shares of mobile assets and of mobile knowledge, will consider their sojourn in any country, including that of their birthplace, even if that were one of the masters of the polycentric order, as an individual uh, contracts, excluding all loyalty and all solidarity with their compatriots. In other words, the, the people who rule you are already international. They don't care where they live, and they have no affinity to any particular country. Well, I shouldn't say any particular. There's always one. It says they'll exile themselves if they feel that they have not gotten their money's worth. They'll move out. Now, we've already seen that with big corporations, and you forget to the big corporations uh, bargain with countries. Uh, to do with their taxes, and should they even pay any taxes at all, and they certainly bang it right down to almost nothing uh, if they get their way. And that happens, all, that Goldman Sachs did that last year, or earlier this year, in fact, with uh, with Britain, and they were up, and the Russia had the hearings about it. They don't put them in court, they're too important to go to court, so they have hearings about it. And But they dictate to the government uh, how much they're willing to pay. Same with big corporations, when they put a factory in somewhere, you'll find your towns and even your state will end up paying for the roads to get built to it. You'll you'll build up most of the buildings for them, their water, their sewage, the lighting, everything is put in by you, the taxpayers. And if it's not profitable enough, after a few months or years, they just up roots and move elsewhere. That happens all the time. We've been in this business for a long, long time. There's no such thing, you see, as truly private enterprise. Uh, and, and democracy, as we say. Everything goes along with big business. So similarly, when businesses, including those uh, of nations now mistresses of the polycentric order, uh, decide that the tax code and the law applicable to them are not the best they might wish for, they'll relocate them, their decision-making centers outside their country of origin. That's happening in Australia now, big time, as big companies are actually advised to move out to into other Asian countries now. States will then compete with one another by announcing massive cuts in taxes or capital. That's already happening, especially in the U.S. Certain states advertise to big business, the, the tax-free basis and so on, uh, for so many years if they, if they come and put up their businesses there. As is, and the innovative class, which will gradually deprive them of their bulk of the resources. Utterly drained and pushed as well by the appearance of self-surveillance devices, states will abandon to the market the task of proposing the bulk of services related to education, health, security, and even sovereignty. In other words, everything's going to get up there into the market for privatization, including your sovereignty. You understand that? I hope you do. And remember, too, that this is all in line with the books written a lawful long, a hundred odd years ago by the Milner Group, that created the Royal Institute for International Affairs in London, in the city of London. And Atali is well aware of that, but he'll never mention it. It's just a continuation of the script, same script. It says, we'll do it first by relocating public services to countries with a low-cost labor force. Well, we're doing that already. In fact, Canada's taxes every year, when you fill in your forms, it's also off to India, and they do it in India, for those who didn't know that. Same in the States as well. And even when it comes down to the census, uh, they send them off to India to do it all, even for the U.S. and Canada. So then, then taxes will go down, uh, and the minimum wage stat- statutes, as well as statutes for the protection of the weakest, will be swept away. Uh, financial insecurity will become the rule for everyone. That's what they've got planned for you. And, of course, we know it now as austerity, you see. And it's certainly hasn't hit the U.S. because they're keeping everything artificially low, even though it's rising, but it's still artificially low compared to, the, compared to the rest of the world because the U.S. has to supply the troops and the equipment and the taxes and uh, for war, you see. There's still other wars to fight after this one. This is an absence of a state. Businesses will increasingly favor consumers over workers whose incomes will go down. That's been happening for years. In fact, the starting wage in Canada really has been the same for about 20-odd years or more. 
Cell surveillance technologies will organize and accelerate this process by favoring the consumer over the user of public services, profit over wages, while giving increasing power to insurance and entertainment companies and to cell surveillance producers. Entertainment companies are awfully important, folks, because you see, as it all goes down, you get more and more and more massive, bizarre, oh, sicko too. It must be even sicko to make sure you're all glued to it out of curiosity. And, uh, and, and as you all go down the tubes, it doesn't seem so bad, you see. Entertainment's awfully important, especially with indoctrination you get via entertainment. And when you go down into debasement, you're easier to manage by the big people at the top. It says then by 2050, at the latest, a slow deconstruction of states, uh, that's nations again, some of them born more than a thousand years ago, will begin. The middle class, the leading player in market democracy, will rediscover the insecurity it believed it had escaped by detaching itself from the working class. Uh, con- that's already happened, I would say, you know, what's left of it. The type of middle class I think about really are above all that. They're up there with uh, Jack Satali, and they're earning millions a year. I mean, that's the real middle class today. Back with more after this break. Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt, we're cutting through the Matrix, talking uh, and reading from a book too, from of Jack Satali, who is a big player up there at the United Nations, uh, a long resume of course, and lots of accolades of his wonderful credentials, etc, 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 but uh, he takes part in all these big think tanks across the world, total globalist of course, and uh, and he's, he's, quite, he's more honest if you can read between the lines sometimes about his part in it. He believes in uh, the long history of the mercantile class as mer- merchant bankers as well, and their right to basically rule off into the future over the general public and, and really create the cultures and train the public towards what they should be to suit those who produce the, the, the big corporations themselves. And it says here too, that um, contract will increasingly win out over law and mercenaries over armies and police forces and arbitrators over judges and jurists specializing in private law will have a field day. For a time, states belonging to countries that are masters of the polycentric order will still be able to control a few rules of their social life. In such states, those politically of age will join forces with their economic counterparts. In other words, the age at which the child becomes an autonomous consumer. In each uh, country, utterly confused political parties will seek more and more vainly for areas of competence. Neither left nor right will be able to prevent the progressive privatization of education, health, security, insurance, nor the replacement of these services by mass-produced objects, nor, a little later, the drawing of super-empire. At the dawning of super empire, the, the right will even accelerate this advent with privatizations. The left will do the same by giving the middle class the means to access more equitably the marketing of time and to private consumption. Public expropriation of big corporations will no longer be a credible solution. The social movements will no longer have the strength to oppose the marketing of the world. Mediocre governments leaning on the few remaining civil servants and on discredited uh, parliamentarians and manipulated by pressure groups will continue to put on shows rarely v- uh, visited and less, and less taken seriously. Public opinion will not show much more interest in their deeds and gestures than they show today in the deeds and gestures of the very last monarchs on the European continent. Nations will be nothing more than oases competing with one another to attract passing caravans. Their way of life will be limited to the rare resources brought by the few nomads who agreed to make a halt there long, long enough to produce trade and entertain themselves. Countries will no longer be lived in at any length by anyone but the sedentary. He's talking about the masses, by the way, the sedentary, when he says that. Because all the rest of them who are making lots of money are called nomads in the New World. They hop from international big city to mega city across the world for their whole lives. So, but the sedentary really are also called the useless eaters in other books, and he's well aware of that too. 
Forced to be there because they're too uh, hostile, too risk, too fragile, too young or too old. And by the weakest, some of them immigrants from elsewhere in search of a more decent way of life. Uh, the only states to pursue development uh, will be those that have attracted the loyalty of their citizens by favoring their creativity, their successful integration and their social mobility. Some nations in the social democratic tradition and some tiny state-run entities will resist better than others. The irony of history with the advance of super empires from the global government. We shall witness the return of those city-states that dominated the beginning of the American trial order. Now that ties right in with uh, the Department of Defense's think tanks report to do with the run-up to world governments a brief period of world government, and then it will return to big city-states, super high-tech city-states, only a few of them across the world. So that's really what he's, he's pointing out here. So he's into all these think tanks because he takes part in them, and he knows what all their predictions are. To prevent this destruction of national identity and stand up to the immigrants' waves that will follow, which is happening now, of course, Racist dictators, whether uh, theocratic or secular, will seize power in certain states or nations. What will soon play out, particularly in countries like Netherlands or Belgium, the first cores of the mercantile world, and amongst the planet's more ancient democracies, will be revelatory of the uh, evolution that the next settles uh, on the most robust states and on those most concerned about their freedoms. While Africa vainly struggles to construct itself, the rest of the world will begin to deconstruct itself under the hammer blows of globalization. Tomorrow's Africa will therefore not resemble today's West. Since rather it is tomorrow's West that will resemble today's Africa. Back with more after this break. You're listening to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Because you can handle the truth. Hi folks, I'm back, cutting through the matrix, and I'll continue with what I'm talking about here, which is Jack's Tally, and of course the big proclamations that he makes in his books about the future, which is here too, pretty well everything I'm reading is, is already taking place, but it's to really blossom and bloom and take off in the next few years as well. And he talks about the, how the West would actually eventually resemble Africa. And he says, and then my opinion, even before the 21st century ends, the government of the United States will itself lose. That was the last bosom of this polycentric world, the essentials of the instruments of sovereignty. This will happen first in the virtual world. As we've seen, the printing press once acted against the powers that be. In the same way, the Internet will act against the United States. It will begin by not serving uh, Washington's interests, then playing on its free-of-charge services, multiplying its information resources, liberating the controls imposed on information by the wealthier. It will drain the U.S. government, like that of the other countries, of many of its important powers. Many people will even claim citizenship of the virtual universe, abandoning citizenship of every real state, even that of the United States. Well, that's already been talked about for years and actually done in, in the U.S. with the, the World Citizenship Association, for those who didn't know about that. And Rockefeller himself gives out World Citizenship Awards. And I think it was back to Plato again. He talked about being a citizen of the world. Very old idea. It says, in the, in the real world, business of American origin will relocate their research centers and their headquarters, thus depriving the federal American state the bulk of its resources. Financing the many functions of sovereignty, in particular of defense, will be more and more uh, onerous. And finally, the citizenry will no longer want to see its children die in battle and will no longer want to be forced to take part in the defense of its country. Uh, certain forces, especially military, will then attempt to restore the means of action to the federal state by nationalizing strategies, strategic businesses, uh, closing the borders and squaring up if necessary to form to former allies. Well, that's already happening now with Britain, the U.S., uh, Canada, and well, actually, it's even Europe. This means of um, this means of information will lie and attempt to dress up an increasingly inaccessible reality. 
in vain on its last legs, Washington will have to relinquish control of the great economic and political decisions to each state of the Union and to the big corporations. Administrative uh, services will be privatized one after the other. Prisons will become private businesses with zero labor costs. They already are, a lot of them. Even the army, the last refuge of sovereignty, will eventually be privatized like all the rest. Then, like the Roman Empire in its day, the American Empire will disappear without leaving a political authority in place in the new Rome. States and nations will still have a place, and nostalgic apparitions, fleeting ghosts, and scapegoats both import, impotent and easy to direct in the absolute marketing of time. And then he goes into the absolute marketing of time. Timing is awfully important for every single part of the stages of the big boys' plan, of course. We know that, and uh, and they actually publish a lot of the stuff for the, for in the future and how the timing is so essential. If you look at all the treaties we're signing year after year and have been for the last uh, 50, 60, 70 years with other countries, they all worked collectively uh, on path for total uh, world integration. Uh, at one time, it was a little, a little bit of a battle between corporations based in one country versus corporations in another as to who would dominate it all, but now it's all come to pass, and we know that uh, it's to be a world government and with the nomadic super uh, countries, um, or, or, or classes, I should say, traveling the world, and they don't mind where they live and where they work, and they'll be kept in utter luxury in these big international city-states. So we're already there to a great extent, as we see it all happening now. Now, the U.S. still has to, on behalf of the masters of the world, and remember, Atali, in in the previous uh, articles I read from the same book yesterday, talked about the masters of the world. They they are they're, they're there. The U.S. still has to, as I say, take down a few other countries, including Iran and other ones, before they're finished. Then they'll be spent, exhausted, and then, of course, they'll, th- they'll throw the whole um, $16 trillion debt that they owe in their face and say, you know, pay up or else, and it'll fall apart. That is the plan. That literally is the plan. And, um, and those who rule America are often don't even live inside America. That is also the case as well. So we're living through a very old agenda. It's part of the Royal Institute of International Affairs based in London. Uh, the, the whole idea of world government free trade, as they called it, free trade for the big international corporations only, mind you, not for you, if you're a small business, is well established. It goes back all the way to James, to John D. He mentioned the British Empire based on free trade, plus the, the one demand that they adopt this same system of government which is now, of course, called democracy. It doesn't matter what they call it. It really doesn't matter what they call it at all, as long as the public believe in it. Because uh, your whole reality is given to you. And, um, and they go on and on from there. Now, the anger of the secular is quite interesting here because Atali himself is a particular religion. And um, he talks about the anger of the secular. He says, uh, Then the anger of peoples will erupt against the mercantile order and above all against the United States, which will direct it for another 20 years, at least a secular anger based on rational premises. Hatred against a core is not unleashed when the core is at its peak of power, but when it begins to decline. And that's so true. This is always a state. The Soviet Union uh, held total sway over its public until it literally, during the Khrushchev era, admitted to some of its faults of Stalin, and became a little bit more relaxed and liberal. They even tried to copy a lot of the culture of the West for the teenagers, very much total copies actually. And once it became a little bit liberal, then they got attacked and then they started declining and crumble. That's always how it happens. But when they're in a totalitarian state and, and using fear and terror, uh, they, they could hold that forever if they wanted to. It says, hatred against a core is not unleashed when the, the core is peak, but when it begins to decline. This was the fate of all the previous cores. It will be the fate of the American Empire. Triumphant at the falling of the Berlin Wall, Washington was already become, it had all become the chief target of a wave of criticism, challenging globalization and a market democracy. Now a critical coalition will emerge targeting America and the mercantile order. It will embrace all those who expect nothing more from them or who are frustrated at not receiving their benefits. 
that criticize America pell-mell, along with the West, globalization, market democracy, and the coming super empire. Anti-globalists of every hue, most will have nothing to propose in their place. Now, a few years ago at one of the, the globalization meetings, the world global meetings, to do with trade, etc., um, you had thousands of protesters turned up. And one politician, everything was in London actually, one of the politicians walked out and he says, okay, I'm here to listen to you, what do you propose? And the, the, none of them had anything to say. All they could say is that they hated what was coming, but they had no idea of what else to, to, to put in its place. You understand? And that's what you've got right now too. It says the criticism will first be directed, and is already being directed, at the invasive role of the United States, which monopolizes the essentials of the world's wealth, uh, wastes its resources, uh, disturbs its climate. Uh, and <laughs> the climate is totally controlled, folks, and it's not just the U.S. Enslaves peoples, claims the right to rule them as it pleases, and violates many rules of the democracy it aspires to dictate to others. Next, the criticism will focus on the markets. This will be all the easier as the facts establish more and more clearly that markets suppress neither poverty nor joblessness nor exploitation, that they concentrate all power in a few hands, inflicting insecurity on increasingly numerous majorities, and that they shelve long-term requirements, that they compete with one another to destabilize the climate, that they create scarcities and invent new cost-free arrangements in order to profit from them later. They will protest that the, the, that hope and the quality of life are not at all the same from one place to another in the world and that the targets of their anger will become, with hyper-surveillance and self-surveillance, one of the most pernicious and absolute forms of dictatorship. And finally, the markets will be reproached from liberating violence by orient, orientating all desires towards a hungering for mercantile objects, including a hunger for arms." It will then be uh, easy to denounce democracy as an illusion in which the wealthiest concentrate in their hands the powers of informing, distracting, knowing, monitoring, healing, teaching, channeling, deciding and accumulating. These new ideologies will will explain that a parliamentary democracy like the market is a deception, the instrument of armed forces and big businesses, which actually it is. And it says that it generates disparities, destroys nature and undermines moral values. They will even argue that it is but a a convenient excuse invoked by Americans to hold on to their power without uh, losing their souls while they shut their eyes on the development of the pirate economy wherever it's useful to them. The mercantile order will thus be justly accused of being for many and by its very nature a source of wretchedness, injustice, insecurity, disorder, waste, ecological upheavals, immorality, identity destruction, a violation of religious rules and oppression. Many will also denounce with a single voice both market and democracy as machines for manufacturing disloyalty, for annihilating all forms of morality and social organization, and for destroying the freedom they claim to promote. Well, that, well that's true. Look, we've been under a form of martial law since 9-11. They still say democracy as we go off to push democracy across countries across the world, the Middle East, that pretty well have done nothing wrong to us. They will really no longer being able to influence the world through their votes. Uh, well, that's true. Of being dominated, uh, monitored, self-monitored, self-produced, uh, and of being forced to comply with norms fixed by the dem- demands of profit. Others will go far, so far as to condemn the very uh, principle of an individual freedom that leads to being loyal only to oneself, to no longer feeling bound uh, by an oath or a contract. They'll complain that they're constantly required to auction off their obligations, their feelings, their values, their faith, and the fate of their children, always ready to abandon and at all moments expecting to be abandoned without the need of future generations ever being taken into account. Apologia for dictatorship will once again become a respectable subject of conversion. Now, it's interesting that because you find that Plato went through the whole systems of democracy and republicanism, etc., And you always find that uh, democracy or liberalism always ends up in a form of dictatorship at the end because of the chaos and the massive debt it accumulates to keep things going and keep everybody happy. It always does massive, massive debt. So they end up with dictatorship. 
And it says, and finally, many will profit from the progressive weakening of states to let their impulses towards violence develop, freed of all constraint. The first freedom will be the freedom to kill, gratuitously and without goals or strategy. The cities where every form of alienation will be abound, uh, along with all the proofs that market democracy is only for the overriding majority of humans, a gigantic moral swindle will become the principal nest of revolt. They will harbor... Why do you think they've got these massive armies ready to go into the cities and do all these practices of doing that, in fact? They know all this. This guy's at the top level here. They will harbor more and more serial criminals, and they will breed an infinity of killings. Unlike the communists of revolution of the past, whose aim was to build another society in place of capitalism, most of these new contestants will propose no system of substitution. Ever since communism failed, no utopia has seemed available either to replace the market or to replace democracy, except for a handful who will propose a return to theocracy. So he goes on about theocracy too and how different faiths will will try and outdo each other and so on and so on and all that will be bashed around too as they try to get to the top. So what I'm saying here is, here is from a guy who's at the top who helps plan the future with thousands of others of his own ilk. And uh, they, they, they go to all the top think tank meetings that they, they're in on the Department of Defenses for NATO countries. That's the US, Britain, France, and other ones, Germany. Uh, they're in on those think tanks to do with the, the coming wars, internal strifes, and even down to, I've read it from the Department of Defense's think tank, uh, as in my website, uh, the archive section, to do with the future where they'll even use small nuclear devices on massive flash mobs in the future who will be protesting anything, food, cost of food, or lack of food, or, or whatever it is. So they're all ready for all of this chaos coming down the pike. And he's a guy telling you about it in such a way that it doesn't seem so horrible because it's quite, he says it rather simply, with no emotion attached to it, you see. And that's why folk won't take it seriously. Now it says, when the polycentric world begins to unravel, that's the many countries, many independent countries, when corsairs, pirates, private armies, mercenaries, and terrorists attempt to take over, totalitarian regimes will slaughter one another to establish supremacy without, without acknowledging any law of war or even any arbitrator. But we've got that now as we go over there to the Middle East and take out countries that are dealing with their own internal strife. You understand, your own country has signed with the United Nations the same orders that no other country should intervene with you if you have internal inter, internal strife going on. But you, you, we'd have been over there to slaughter these folk. Of course, we started all the problems there in the first place, because we sent in all the agitators. So, then that's geopolitics, that's what happens. So he talks about um, countries of the north will form alliances with those of the south, while Islamist terrorists will join forces with drug cartels. Well, so does the CIA. Uh, there was, and by the way, he's, this guy's from France, remember? And they, they, in France and Marseille, that's where all the, the, the heroin uh, it comes out of. It comes from the opium, and they, and they have massive facilities there, big massive labs, always have had, where they process the world's heroin supply. And it's distributed across the world, so he's well aware of that. It says there will be simultaneously be hot wars and cold wars, private wars and state wars. Uh, police and armed forces will mingle with one another without respecting the most elementary rules of warfare. Civilian populations will be a helpless prey, as was the case in World War II, meaning if you're occupied and so on, well, that's how you will be in your own countries. You can't tell the difference between cops and, and uh, soldiers uh, when they're armed to the teeth and all mixing together. It says the religions of the book will fight one another to the greater glory of their enemies. Some theologians will see in this the advent of the battle signaling in the book the end of days, an end for the Jews that most lead to the arrival of their Messiah. For Christians, it is linked with his return. For certain Muslims, with the, the hidden imam, and for Hindus, it's marked by the advent of Kalki, Vishnu's tenth and final incarnation. In all cases, they, they say, it will end with the victory of good over evil. And that's what everybody, even at the bottom level, it doesn't matter how religious or non-religious they are, they always look for good winning over evil, even though you've never had any proof of it in history. <laughs> history is written by victors. Every war, remember, 
every war is projected as the good war, the just war. And your countries will go to all ends to make sure that's taught forever in the history books. Back with more after this break. Folks, I'm back. We're cutting through the matrix and talking about Jack Satali and reading from his book, A Brief History of the Future. He goes into this a scenario after all of the stuff I've read here, into a scenario of a final conflict idea. Or, he said it could be, he says, the alternative is yet, well before humanity has just put an end to its history, at least I would like to th- believe this, that the failure of super empire and the threat of hyper a conflict will compel the democracies to find sufficient motivation to vanish the, vanquish the pirates, the non-state entities and the rogue states and supply uh, that, and suppress their own death wish. And more an optimistic and more likely view is that alliances, armies will sweep the dictators aside, the drug cartels will be tamed while the U.S. is running because the military is over in Afghanistan running the the poppy uh, seeds uh, plantations. Big corporations will no longer gamble their future on the growth of military or orders. All religions will calm down and become forces for peace, reason and tolerance. Already at work, new forces will seize power in order to create a just uh, pacific United and brotherly world. That's his little bit then. And then he goes into how, he says, and then it's happened after the fall of the Roman Empire, there will be a rebirth on the ruins of a promising past spoiled by an excessively long series of mistakes. A mighty long, longing to live joyful interbreeding, he says, uh, jubilant transgressions, and then a new civilization will surge forth. That's what they envisage after all of this massive chaos. And, of course, he doesn't go into the depopulation agenda, which would be part of that, to bring in this wonderful uh, interbreeding uh, of different peoples and wonderful utopia. He doesn't touch on that at all. But that's uh, that's really what uh, is to take place as well. He doesn't mention that because he's writing this for the general public. And then he goes on about that. The final chapter is the, the third wave of the future, which is planetary democracy. That's quite interesting, too, because just previously that he mentioned that democracy had become a joke and nobody believed in it anymore. But they must bring it back, the same joke, back again. And, and it, once again, they can convince people that it's real. It's amazing how people never learn their whole lives that nothing in democracies ever worked for them, ever. After one party after another, they've gone downhill, 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 and nothing that they actually wish the governments to do has ever been done for them either. They're completely ignored. And politicians lie constantly. That's what they do. They're picked because they have the psychopathic with a good smiling face, and they can lie without blinking. So he wants to return back to democracy in in this this, uh, new unified world that's gone through all of its wars, tribulations, depopulation, and everything else into this wonderful utopia. And, of course, he's talking on behalf of the elites themselves. So, in other words, they've covered all of these scenarios, every single scenario that could possibly happen, in minute detail, remember. Even the opposition groups that will rise up through time to oppose them uh, and uh, how they'll deal with them. And we know how they've dealt with them in the past. They generally create them themselves rather than wait for one to spring up from the grassroots. Then they've got it controlled from the beginning. Very old con that one is. So we're living through a planned script, remember. And um, this global idea, globalization, is not a pleasant thing whatsoever. It's bad enough when you live in a big country like the U.S. or Canada and you have a government, you know, maybe thousands of miles away across the country. You can't get to them. That's bad enough. Uh, that's a centralization of government, of course, that they wanted even from the days of Karl Marx, which they have, and big business is all for it. But when they have a central government, maybe at the North Pole, or who knows where they're going to put it for a global government, uh, you, you'll be a minute uh, floating on the planet, so like an amoeba somewhere with no recourse, no no recall, you can't get heard, and that's the world they want to bring in. It will not be pleasant. From Hamish Marcel from Ontario, Canada, it's good night, so may your God or your gods go with you.